We've all seen images from places around the world where poverty is pretty rampant. Maybe you've seen charity advertisements like this. Maybe you see it in the news reports after big tragedies or natural disasters. It's being described as the worst humanitarian crisis in Mozambique's history, and many of Edai's victims are once again finding themselves in danger. The point is, these are pretty common images. You probably grew up with this trope of not wanting to waste your food because there's starving kids in Africa. Like, food waste is probably something we should try and minimize for its own sake, but our guilt's not gonna feed anyone in Africa. Oh, and also we probably have starving kids in our own neighborhoods, so we can start there. But the point I'm trying to make is that we are aware of poverty, extreme poverty, global poverty. We, we know a lot about it. At least we think we do. But I spend quite a bit of time working in low-income countries. My work in climate and storytelling has brought me to parts of Haiti, Tanzania, Mexico that are poor by those countries' standards. I've gotten to learn from people who have the least as far as material possessions go, and what I've learned is there is so much about global poverty that we don't understand. Seeing these images without getting the full story really flattens our understanding of a condition that is probably more intense more sophisticated, but not nearly as hopeless as we might consider. I could sit here right now and just list off all the ways we get things wrong with how we talk about poverty, but I'm not gonna do that. Instead, let's go to Burundi. This is my life. But you have a world idea. Good morning from Bujumbura, Burundi. I slept extremely well last night. So Burundi is often said to be the poorest country in the world. And now you probably know I don't really like that description. I don't like to paint a country that uh, is much more sophisticated, that has so much to offer with a single brush stroke, especially one that just describes what it doesn't have. But for many, that is the thing that stands out about Burundi. The poorest country in Africa. The world's poorest country. The poorest country in the world. It's not just travel vloggers looking for clickbait, it's international development institutions, places that closely monitor and rank things like quality of life or food security. But you know, those stats, those figures, they only give you one single story, and there's always so much more going on. But to get to know that, you need to meet people, you need to talk to people, and that's what we're here to do. Now one of the reasons why that's so significant is climate. It means these people have to grow their own food that they're going to eat, the food that they're going to sell for an income, and when their environment's unhealthy, when their land is suffering, when they aren't getting enough rain, they can't do that. We're on our way to Makamba, which is down at the southern end of Burundi, almost near Tanzania. We're going to be in some pretty rural communities. Burundi overall is a pretty rural country. Around 87% of Burundians live in a rural location. 84% of people living in poverty around the world live in rural areas and rely on growing their own food for their nutrition and income. And it took me a long time to realize that. Before, when you talked about poverty, my mental image would be of the favelas in Rio or the slums in Nairobi. Now those are real places where you can find poverty for sure. But the vast majority of people who live in poverty live in rural, remote locations. One big implication of this is that climate change really contributes to poverty. People here have to grow their own food, and income comes from selling produce at the market, and so not being able to grow enough has a harsh effect. Now even these things are changing. We're starting to see poverty drift more urban, and a big part of that is that when climate change makes it impossible to earn a living through farming, people will go into cities to look for work. We're about to meet a community, and you didn't think that wasn't gonna happen without a bit of a climb, would you? We're visiting a guy named Enos, and not just him, but his entire purpose group. I'm gonna explain more about what that means in a second, but first, you've got to see this welcome they give us. So, who is this group? They don't have a bank. In a village like this, there are no financial institutions. What that means is there's nowhere to save money, no way to borrow money, and no support for overcoming poverty. So community members are taking things into their own hands. Village savings groups allow community members to become their own bank. 
And these have taken off in popularity in Africa, the Caribbean, South Asia, and other parts of the world. People save their money amongst each other. They borrow money from each other. This boxes the bank and people determine their own rules. These are sometimes called VICOBAs or VSLs. Plant with Purpose calls them purpose groups. And, and this makes a real impact. How many people were able to send their children to school because of the group? How many were able to start uh, businesses or income generating activities? Similar question, how many people were able to improve their, their homes or their households where they live? So Enos participated with this group, and here's all he was able to accomplish. We were invited to see what dinner time was like for Enos and his family. What's for dinner? Ugali, lenga lenga. Thanks to participation in a purpose group, Enos was able to learn climate resilient farming skills and start income generating activities. <laughs> To put it simply, this is what growing out of poverty looks like. Three meals a day, no skipping meals. The world is diverse. Development will look a bit different wherever you go. If you're used to it looking one way, you might look for cities or certain technologies, and you might think anything other than that is still poverty. If you do, you miss out on accomplishments like this. Three meals a day, no skipping meals. Those are some big strides and it's easy for someone like me to take that change for granted because I've always eaten three meals a day without ever having to skip. But also, Enos has five kids. So when everyone's eating three times a day without missing meals, that's a lot of mouths to feed. So there's a lesson from this visit to Enos. Actually, there's quite a few lessons we can learn. First of all, poverty is not permanent. Enos went from eating one meal a day, often having to skip meals, to having three solid meals every single day. Also, he has five kids. So, you know, five times, three, that's a lot of meals. That's a lot of mouths to feed. I'm also seeing how you can't just measure poverty in dollars and cents. I mean, sometimes income can be a helpful indicator of some things, but it really doesn't tell the whole story. It makes sense why Plant With Purpose and other development organizations would prefer an index that uses different indicators, things like whether a person has uh, a proper floor or just dirt inside the house, uh, whether how long does it take someone to go get water, are you able to send your daughters to school, those kinds of things. Tell a whole story that, that income doesn't always capture. <laughs> Enos was a great example of how one person can overcome poverty. But is that possible for societies, or even entire countries, can they too escape poverty? Now as far as places I've visited go, Burundi is definitely on the extreme end of the spectrum regarding poverty. But I've also been to other countries that we often think of as poor, that are lower income compared to the US, Canada, and Europe. And it's not always this extreme. It usually isn't. Mexico had some amazing fine dining. Tanzania and Rwanda are some of the most online countries in Africa. This Guatemalan granny told me all about taking care of her babies before electricity was common, and then she proceeded to make me mole in her electric blender. People in the Philippines love them all, and with the uh, air conditioning contrasting with the humidity outside, I don't blame them. Sure, all these countries have pretty high poverty rates, but it's also way too easy to think of the world as a set of rich countries and poor countries, rather than what it really is, a spectrum with a whole bunch of countries in the middle. Take a look at this graph, it's by Hans Rosling, and it measures life expectancy and income over time. So where you want to be is that upper right corner. Colors on this graph represent different parts of the world. So Africa is blue, Asia is red, the Americas are green, and Europe is yellow. The size of these circles represents population. Okay, start this in 1900 and watch what happens over the next 120 years. We get to see a lot of Europe head right for that top right corner, joined by a few exceptions like Argentina, Australia, Canada, and the US. And now over time, everyone's moving vertically, everyone's living longer. Pause when I was born, 1990. Now take a look at the movement to the right over the course of my lifetime. Those two big red circles, you might have guessed, China and India. 
Look, I can even track specific countries on this thing. This green line is Francesca in Guatemala going from raising her twin kids by candlelight to making me mole out of a plug-in blender in her house. That red line, that's all the change my grandma saw in the Philippines over her lifetime. Now in terms of income, unfortunately, Burundi is one of those countries that stayed where it was or in some cases went lower, but life expectancy still went up. So Hans Rosling didn't just make these graphs, he wrote this book called Factfulness, which I am a huge fan of, and he argues that looking at the world as rich countries and poor countries from a place like the US is kind of like looking over a city from a skyscraper. From If you're in one of the tallest buildings in the world, every building is going to look short in comparison. You're not noticing the differences between a 30-story and a 60-story if you're standing on a 100-story building. There's this great big irony around the world where countries close to the equator, countries with rich fertile soil or tropical climates have often long struggled with poverty. The reason for this is something that's not very fun to think about, but it is something we have to confront, colonialism. Countries like Indonesia or Guatemala with this rich volcanic soil perfect for growing things like coffee were totally exploited by things like the Dutch East Indies Company or the United Fruit Company from the US. The lush Congo seems to always have the stuff people want, whether that's rubber in the 18th century or cobalt now, and this was exploited pretty bad, especially during King Leopold's reign. Now lately I've been feeling a lot more strongly that if you're going to be talking about poverty, if you're going to be telling the story about poverty, you need to include these details. People are not just poor out of nowhere, there's typically a lot of exploitation that has happened throughout history. We often slide into two extremes when talking about poverty. One end of the spectrum is just all about pity. It only focuses on the sensational stuff, the things you might find in outdated charity infomercials. There's like such a strong effort by some to avoid talking negatively about poverty that people end up romanticizing it. You ever hear someone say something like, I don't understand how people live with so little and yet have so much joy. See, that's not the story I get when I talk to Enos, his wife, or their community. They don't hold back when talking about their challenges or their struggles or how hard it's been. It would not be right for me to censor out that part of their story. This brings up one of our biggest misconceptions about poverty, that it's inevitable. No place has to remain in poverty. People can overcome poverty. You can ask any Korean grandparent who's lived long enough to see their country go from widespread poverty to an economic and cultural superpower. Now when you see the big picture, you'll see how all these people we've met have overcome these challenges. Of course, people don't just overcome it passively. It takes the constant effort of working against the things that keep people poor, whether that's injustice or climate change or conflict. We know that people can do this, are doing this, every single day. Let's meet one more person. Welcome to Miriam's Convenience. This is a small shop in Makamba, Burundi. Here you can buy maize meal, flip-flops, seasoning, beans, animal feed, dresses, and other goods. And this is Miriam, its founder. This is helping her to have food at home. Mm. Now it's not a problem to get something to eat for the children, mm. and it's very, very good. Here's one final thing we often get so wrong when we talk about poverty. We oftentimes lose the distinction between seeing people and seeing poverty. My friend Luis in Mexico says it best. He's worked in the, some of the country's poorest states for decades, and he always points out that poverty is a condition. It's not a character trait, it's not a personality or a destiny, it's just a condition. Big thanks to the Plant With Purpose Burundi team for making this visit happen. Thank you especially to folks like Enos and Mariam for opening up and sharing your stories and experiences with me. You're the ones we should all be learning from. Uh, thank you to Dave and Holly Hepburn for uh, the footage here. And uh, yeah, thanks to you for watching. <laughs>